Good morning. I would encourage everyone to grab a Bible and open it up to 2 Chronicles 33. 2 Chronicles 33. We're going to be there in just a couple minutes. It will not be the first book we look at, but it will be the second. So you've got that to look forward to. 2 Chronicles 33, that's where we're going to spend most of our time this morning as we examine a character that, in my opinion, is vastly underrated. Not because he's so evil, but because his story, in my opinion, sparks what is arguably one of the greatest repentance stories, even though it's much compressed, I think, that you can find the entire scripture. So that's where we're going to spend most of our attention in this morning. Before we talk about him, though, I want to talk about this guy. I think most of us are familiar with Joel Osteen. We talked about it a little bit during the class this morning. Most of us know this guy. We know somebody similar to him. We see them all over television. My intent this morning is not necessarily to pick on this guy. I just want to talk about something that he says real quick. If you've ever turned into Lakewood Church's services down in Houston, you notice that Joel Osteen follows a very predictable pattern. And he always begins all of his lessons or sermons, or whatever they call it, he always begins all of them by the same three things. He first begins by saying, raising his Bible and saying, this is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. I can do what it says I can do. I can hear his voice rattling around my brain right now. Today, I will proclaim the word of God. I boldly profess my mind is alert. My heart is receptive. I will never be the same in Jesus' name. And that's where everybody says amen at the end of it. Now, you can make fun of Joel Osteen for a lot of different things. I don't think this is necessarily one of them. I think it's a totally fine thing to live by the Bible. That's what we profess every Sunday and Wednesday. That's what we profess throughout our lives is that we live by what the Bible says. It's a little bit campy to do it every single week, but I think the idea is more or less admirable. He says right after that, though, Lord Jesus, I repent of my sin. Come into my heart. Wash me clean. I make you my Lord and Savior. That's a little bit shakier ground. Most of us are familiar with this idea. We'll talk about it at length this morning. But what he's essentially doing here is talking about the sinner's prayer. This is something that a lot of us have heard from our denominational friends. We hear people talk about this being the main vehicle for salvation. But I'll even give him just a little bit of credit for this because I think you see something along these lines-ish throughout the book of Psalms. For instance, when you look at Psalm 51, David very openly says, create in me a clean heart, renew my spirit. So there's an idea in which Mr. Osteen isn't too far off the mark of this. What he says next, though, is what I have a really big problem with. Right after that, he says, friends, if you said that simple prayer... We believe he got saved. The whole idea of the sinner's prayer was started, you can argue whether it's 300 years ago or you can argue it's about 60, 70 years ago. You can talk about the first great awakening right before the American independence, 1750s, where people like George Whiteside and people like Jonathan Edwards are just going out there and just barnstorming left and right. And you have these troves of thousands of people that are standing at his feet. He would usually flip over a cart and he would stand on top of the cart and he would just preach for hours. And these people were just relentless. And at the end of it, he would talk about some version of this, some idea about how you need to pray a prayer. You need to make some kind of action, some kind of altar call, if you will. But this idea specifically was popularized during the Billy Graham revivals of the 50s and 60s and 70s. Some of us are familiar with those where Billy Graham gets up on stage and in television in front of thousands and in some cases even a couple hundred thousand people. And he has this long sermon. And at the very end, he asks everybody to make this bold, declaration of faith. And you see this all over the place in the religious world today, whether it's through your television set, whether it's in church buildings across America, people are asking you just to say that simple prayer for the sole reason, as he says here, because that's how you're going to get saved. That's what you need to do in order to be saved. I appreciate Levi reading from us from Romans chapter 10, because that's where a lot of people get this idea. When you look at Romans chapter 10, verses 8 down through verse 13, he says very simply that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will Will be saved. And so that's the, all the evidence that a lot of people need to kind of reinforce this idea of what the sinner's prayer is all about. My argument is, with all of this, is not that necessarily praying out to God at a time when you are in deep distress is wrong. My problem is, is believing that the sinner's prayer is all you need to do to be saved. And that's the problem with what Joel Osteen says at the end of all these services. That's the problem with where Billy Graham went wrong. That's the problem with a lot of these types of ideas, is it short changes the real process of salvation. And thankfully, there's a lot of people in the religious world that are kind of catching on to this. David Gushy, for instance, who is a rather well-known 
preacher, I won't call him a pastor, he's a rather well-known preacher, and I think in the uh, Southern Baptist community, he says anyone can, and most Americans do, believe in Jesus rather than some alternate Savior. I don't think he's wrong in that. A lot of people in America especially do believe in Jesus as being their Savior. Anyone can, and many Americans do sometimes, say a prayer asking Jesus to save them. But not many, listen to this, not many of them embark on a life fully devoted to the love of God, the love of neighbor, the moral practices of God's will, and radical, costly discipleship. What David Gushy is observing, and keep in mind that this philosophy falls right in line with his theology. This is what he believes. What he's saying is, it's one thing to say a prayer. It's a completely separate matter to back that up with your life. There was a guy who several years ago, I think about 8, 9, 10 years ago, was by the name of Paul Washer. And you can believe what you want to about Paul Washer if you're even familiar with the name, if you've seen his stuff on YouTube. He got into a lot of trouble one time because I think he was a member of the Southern Baptist community and he got up in front of a youth group of about, I think, two, 3,000 people. And he boldly said, he didn't tell anybody ahead of time what he was going to say, he boldly told them that if their salvation rested on a simple prayer, that that salvation wasn't valid. He got absolutely torched because of that by people that he was friends with, by his own family, by people within that community right there that were watching it. But what he was saying is essentially the same thing that people have been saying for thousands of years, which is that it's not enough just to say a prayer that there's absolutely no transformation in your life. The problem that I have with the sinner's prayer, number one, is that it's undoctrinal. But the second problem that I have is that it rolls people into a false sense of salvation. You are not saved, ladies and gentlemen, simply by saying a prayer. Now let me kind of reinforce this a little bit. I do not believe, for instance, that we all have to show, just show up every time towards God in prayer fully clean, 100% right. There is an aspect in which the sinner's prayer applies. Let me reinforce that. Look at Luke, the 18th chapter. I told you to go Second Chronicles. That was mainly so we could put our little marker there. But in Luke, the 18th chapter, you see what is in essence the sinner's prayer. And this is what I do believe in, for lack of a better phrase. Luke, the 18th chapter, starting in verse 9, he says, He also told this parable to some people who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and viewed others with contempt. That background material is really important to understanding this parable. He says very simply in verse 10, Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. And the Pharisee stood and was praying this to himself, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people. Notice the condescension in his voice. I thank you that I'm not like other people. Swindlers, unjust, adulterers, even like this tax collector over here. After all, I fast twice a week. I pay tithes of all that I get. The tax collector, however, standing at some distance away, was even unwilling to lift up his eyes to heaven, but was beating his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. I tell you, verse 14, this man went to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but he who humbles himself will be exalted. That's the sinner's prayer that I believe in. You know why? Not because I think that he's saved in that moment. That's not at all what I mean. That's the sinner's prayer that I believe in. You know why? Because what he recognizes in that moment is that he is in desperate need of God's salvation. That's the difference between the tax collector and the Pharisee in this passage. Not that one necessarily was more pure than the other. Not that one of them was just completely horrible and, and just a complete sinner from top to bottom. But that one of them realized the need for God and for his holiness and the other one didn't. And that's ultimately what Paul was getting at. Romans, the third chapter, verse 23, after he spends all of chapter 2 kind of leading into this idea of why the Jews need salvation, the pinnacle comes in Romans 3 and verse 23 when he says we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Do you believe that? Do I believe that? Do we truly believe that we are in need of God's grace? Or do we sometimes fall more under the vein of this Pharisee? Where we say, I'm so glad I'm not like that guy. I'm so glad I'm not like the people who are over there. The people that I see driving by that cut you, once again, that cut you off on the way to Taco Bell. Those are the worst human beings alive. I just, I can't get past those people. I'm glad I'm not like those guys. Do we sometimes think about that? Or do we recognize the need for God's grace in our life? I want to talk about this morning a person by the name of Manasseh. Look at 2 Chronicles chapter 33. This realization, I would argue that we are in need of God's grace. I don't think comes somewhat naturally to us. I think as Americans, and certainly as Texans, we're bred to believe about ourselves that we can build ourselves up by our own bootstraps. 
The anything we need, you just go out and grab it. You don't really need anybody. There's a lot of other societal movements that are kind of teaching that same type of philosophy. You don't need anything else. You can do it all by yourself. And if there's anybody that kind of epitomized what this meant, I would argue that it's probably Manasseh, the most ungodly king, bar none, that ever sat on the throne of Israel. For 40 years, this guy sat on the throne and did every single type of abysmal and immoral thing that you can think of while he was king. To make matters worse, his dad was Hezekiah, arguably one of the greatest kings to ever reign on Israel. Reign in Israel. But in 2 Chronicles chapter 33, listen to this rap sheet this guy has. Starting in verse 1, it says, Manasseh was 12 years old when he became king. He reigned 55 years, so more than the 40. I misquoted you a second ago. 55 years in Jerusalem. He did evil in the sight of the Lord according to the abominations and nations whom the Lord dispossessed before the sons of Israel. For he rebuilt the high places which Hezekiah his father had broken down. His grandson Josiah is going to actually tear them down for good. He also erected altars for the Baals, made ashram, worshipped all the host of heaven and served them. He built altars in the house of the Lord of which the Lord had said, My name shall be in Jerusalem Jerusalem forever. For he built altars for all the host of heaven in the two courts of the house of the Lord. I want to slow this down real quick. Did you see what verse 5 said? Not only did this guy institute idolatry inside of Jerusalem proper, he put it inside the temple courts. Remember, it was not too many decades previous to this when a king ran into the temple and came out as a leper. It wasn't too many years before this. Look at verse 6. I want to look at this. He made his sons pass through the fire in the valley of Ben-Hinnom, which is essentially burning his own children alive. He practiced witchcraft. He used divination. He practiced sorcery and dealt with mediums and spirits. He did evil in the sight of the Lord, provoking him to anger. Then he put the carved image of the idol which he had made inside the house of God, of which God had said to David and to his psalm and his son, In this house and in Jerusalem, which I have chosen from all the tribes of Israel, I will put my name forever. I will not again remove the foot of Israel from the land which I have appointed for your fathers, if only they will observe to do all that I have commanded them according to all the law, the statutes, and the ordinances given through Moses. Twice in these eight verses, ladies and gentlemen, it is said that Manasseh not only put something, an idol, inside the temple, but the text indicates that he deliberately removed God from God's place. Verse 5 and verse 8, or verse 4 and verse 8. Both of these verses say that God said, my name will be here forever. And yet what Manasseh did was remove God's name from there and put up his own idol. I can't think of a more affront or a bigger affront towards God than that. And verse 9 just sums up the entire attitude that Manasseh had in 2 Chronicles chapter 33 and verse 9 when it says that Manasseh misled Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to do more evil than all the nations whom the Lord destroyed before the sons of Israel. Not only is Manasseh the worst king of Israel, he's the worst king in the region for centuries. He is a horrible, horrible human being. Now you may ask yourself, why are you emphasizing how horrible this guy is? And it's quite frankly to illustrate the fact that not many people that I can think of are worse than this guy. You know, the standard for evil in our culture is usually Hitler. If somebody's evil, they say, well, he's, he's no Hitler. Manasseh was Hitler on steroids. Manasseh was not only Hitler in the terms of his genocidal maniacness, hyphenicness. He was also spiritually bankrupt. He also defamed the name of God openly in religious ceremonies. And he reigned for ten times longer than Hitler did. This guy is the worst individual to sit on any throne. And he did it for years. In verse 10, the Lord spoke to Manasseh and to his people, but they paid no attention. Therefore, the Lord brought the commanders of the army of the king of Assyria against them. They captured Manasseh with hooks, bound him, bound him with bronze chains, and took him to Babylon. That's the punishment for his sins. That's the punishment for what he did. It's punishment for what he gets. Kings, I think, expounds on this idea a little bit more, maybe a little bit more gruesome detail, but that's what he gets. And if you look at what he says in verses 12 through 13, that should be the end of the story. But listen to what happens here in verses 12 and 13. It says, Now when he was in distress, he entreated the Lord his God and humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers. And when he prayed to him, he was moved by his entreaty, heard his supplication, brought him again to Jerusalem to his kingdom, and then Manasseh knew that the Lord was God. That's the original sinner's prayer, ladies and gentlemen. 
You don't get much worse in this world than somebody like Manasseh. Spiritually bankrupt, completely immoral, led the people of God astray, took the nation physically down to its lowest point that it would ever have in its entire history. And yet verses 12 and 13, two simple verses that talk about that when Manasseh was in his great distress, for whatever reason, he turned back towards God. You know, you get this idea when you read about the story of Manasseh that he's kind of the Old Testament version, even though in much less detail. It's kind of the Old Testament version of somebody like Paul the Apostle. Somebody who Paul openly said that I am the chief of all sinners. He says that he's the least eminent apostle. He talks down on himself all the time. And then he says in 1 Timothy chapter 1 that grace was given to him to show the depth of God's mercy. That's the primary reason. In essence, if Paul can be saved, anybody can be saved. And here's the lesson for this morning. If Manasseh can be saved then anybody can be saved. Now you may be asking yourself this morning, besides the obvious, why is it that we're sitting here talking about Manasseh? I'll tell you real quick. I was at a church one time, not preaching, I was listening. I was much younger, much more handsome, if you can even believe that. But I was at a congregation with one of my really good friends, and I was listening to the Bible class, and my friend was sitting, we'd study a few times, he was sitting next to me. Somebody on the other side of the auditorium raised their hand, and I can't remember what the class was about. Somebody on the other end of the auditorium raised their hand, and they asked a very simple question. They asked, do you believe that God hears the prayers of a sinner? Very simple question, you would think. And the teacher kind of stumbled through it a little bit. He kind of him hawed around a few answers. I don't, I don't think he was the, quote, normal preacher. I think he was just, you know, somebody kind of filling in. And he eventually arrived at the answer of no. He said, no, I do not believe that God hears the prayers of a sinner. And I didn't like the answer. I didn't like what he said. My friend certainly did not like the answer that he gave. And that led to more Bible discussions about that very point and eventually leading to this person turning his back completely on God. And I put that moment, it's kind of being at least when it was obvious to me that it, he wasn't ever going to become a Christian. And here's the issue that I have with what he said. I do not disagree necessarily. Let me qualify this. I do not necessarily disagree with the answer. Does God hear sinners? No. What I do disagree with vehemently is that he did not qualify that. Because when you look in passages like, for instance, John the ninth chapter, there's this whole story of the blind man. And I, I mentioned this in our Bible reading a few weeks ago. The story of the blind man is one of the most underrated stories in the Gospels. Because you have this blind man who doesn't know anything outside of what's immediately happening to him. Doesn't know who touched him. Doesn't know how he became blind. Doesn't really know the conversation leading up to it. All he knows is he points out in this passage that he was blind and now he sees. And one of the things that the blind man points out here in John the 9th chapter verses 24 through 31 is very obviously that God does not hear the, the prayers of sinners. He states that openly. God does not hear the prayers of sinners. But what he also says is that if anyone is righteous, he hears him. Well, where do you get that? How do you get from somebody who is unrighteous, whom God does not hear, to somebody who is righteous, whom God does hear? Here's where that bridge needs to be made in every conversation surrounding this. The attitude of the person that is making the prayer. You know, Isaiah chapter 59, verses 1 and 2. Two verses that, in my mind, speak volumes about the nature of sin. Isaiah 59, verses 1 and 2, Isaiah simply says that the Lord's hand is not so short that it cannot save. His ear is not so dull that it can't hear you, but your sins have separated you from God. The problem is not God's willingness. It is not God's grace. It's the attitude to turn back to Him in the first place. What Manasseh represents to all of us, and what Paul, I think, represents in the New Testament, is somebody who wants to know about God, who actually genuinely wants to turn their heart back towards God. Does God hear the prayer of a sinner? No. He does not hear the prayer of somebody who is obstinately stubborn, anti-God, refuses to follow Him, doesn't want to listen to Him, and is really kind of only using Him as an emergency button. That's not the right time, necessarily. That's not the moment. But in any situation, especially as Manasseh points out, even when you're in prison, even when you're in great distress, if you realize who God is and you are sincere about turning your life back to Him, then I do believe with all my heart that God hears you. I believe that God has heard me. Even in some of the periods of my life when I'm in so deep darkness away from God that the only outlet that I have is to talk to Him. I do believe He hears me. Hopefully because I was sincere. Hopefully because my actions, as we talked about this morning, manifest that repentance in my life. Why are we talking about Manasseh? 
Because Manasseh represents the reality of somebody who is so far apostate and so far away from God, they couldn't be farther away. And yet cries out in their humility and in their sincerity, begging God for forgiveness. Which all of us are, to some extent, a part of that. I'm going to make a few converse, or quick conversations. And when I say quick, I actually do mean quick. Make a few quick observations about the prayer of Manasseh. Number one, saying a prayer of repentance doesn't absolve you of all the physical consequences. You know, you would be hard-pressed to find somebody who was more upset about what happened to him than David. And in Psalm 51, and especially in Psalm 32, as we'll discuss, I think it's next week, when you look at those two psalms, David uses very vivid imagery to describe his heartache at his own sins and what it caused. But as sorrowful as he was, it didn't eliminate what happened to him after that. The sword would never depart from his house. He lost his only son, or he lost his son, the fruit of that union between him and Bathsheba. It didn't absolve him of all the physical consequences. And Manasseh, I think it's in Kings and maybe some other king that I'm thinking of, but I think it's recorded about Manasseh that they literally killed his kids right in front of him and then gouged out his eyes. Maybe I'm thinking of some other king. Somebody else can correct me on that. But regardless, when Manasseh comes back to his kingdom and sees the, the litany of all the things that are behind him, just the collateral damage as a result of his sins, just because he prayed to God doesn't mean all those physical consequences go away. And I think sometimes we think that. That if I just use God as a panic button, just kind of hit that button as hard as I can and pray to God and tell Him how sorry I am, then all this stuff will magically just fly away. It doesn't. Manasseh still came back to the same kingdom he left in tatters before he left. Except this time when he came back, he came back actually right with God. Number two, I would argue that sometimes it takes a dungeon to realize the necessity of forgiveness. Now, there are some people in this world that will never, ever, ever understand what God's mercy is all about. There are some people who you can talk about grace with them, you can talk about it with me, you can talk about it with us. We just don't realize how beautiful and how powerful grace is until we're in the dungeon. Manasseh had heard for years from all the prophets, that's what he mentions there in verses 8 and 9, that he had heard for years from all the prophets and all the things that he was doing wrong. But it wasn't until he was in the dungeon that he rock bottom that he turned his life around. But at the very least, it's better to be late than never. Sometimes it takes a dungeon to realize the necessity of forgiveness. And here's the key point, especially as it regards to the, quote, sinner's prayer in today's world. That what starts in prayer must be finished with our life. I want you to look back at 2 Chronicles 33, starting in verse 14. 2 Chronicles 33, starting in verse 14, after Manasseh comes back to his kingdom. It says, Now after this he built the outer wall of the city of David on the west side of Gihon in the valley, even to the entrance of the fish gates. He encircled the Ophel with it, made it very high. Then he put army commanders in all the fortified cities of Judah. Listen to this. He removed the foreign gods and the idol from the house of the Lord, as well as all the altars which he had built on the mountain of the house of the Lord and in Jerusalem. He threw them outside the city. He set up the altar of the Lord and sacrificed peace offerings and thank offerings on it. And he ordered Judah to serve the Lord God of Israel. What a huge declaration. Nevertheless, verse 17, the people still sacrificed the high places, although only to the Lord their God. Has a question mark over it? To read 1 Kings chapter 3 and realize Psalm more or less did the same. Now the rest of the acts of Manasseh, even his prayer to his God, the words of the seers who spoke to him in the name of the Lord God of Israel, behold, they are among the records of the kings of Israel. His prayer, also verse 19, and how God was entreated by him, and all his sin, his unfaithfulness, all the sites on which he had built high places and erected the ashram and the carved images before he humbled himself, behold, they are written in the records of the Hosei. Wouldn't you love to read that? Verse 20, so Manasseh slept with his fathers. They buried him in his own house. And Ammon, his son, became king in his place. I'm not going to comment on how horrible of a human being Manasseh was. I think we've exhausted that to the nth degree. But what I do want you to realize when you look at verses 14 through 20 is that this guy, as horrible as he was, realized where he was at and prayed to God for forgiveness. And as far as we can tell, it was granted him. He came back and his actions backed that up. All of us, no matter where you're at in your life, have the same opportunity. Hopefully you're not in the dungeon. Hopefully you're not sitting around thinking about how horrible your life has come. How you just keep spiraling and spiraling and spiraling where you can't even see the clouds anymore. But if you are in that position, realize that Manasseh was ten times worse. And if Manasseh can come back to God, then so can you. But what starts in prayer must be finished with our life. 
Paul's conversion didn't happen on the road to Damascus, as much as our denominational friends would love to say it did. It did not happen on the road to Damascus. Did he acknowledge Jesus as Lord? Yeah. But if you look at what he says, God says specifically to Ananias there in Acts 9th chapter, he says, go and show him, because he still needs to do stuff. Arise and be baptized. Wash away your sins. That was what was lacking with Paul. As much as he had the statement of faith, as much as he believed in God, as much as he asked for forgiveness, he still needed to be baptized. And he still needed to live the rest of his life in obedience towards God. That's what true conversion is all about. And so if you're here this morning, you find yourself in a Manasseh-like position, where you are so far away from God, know that it's not too late. Turn your life around and treat Him with a humble and with a pure heart. Put Him on through the waters of baptism, repent of your sins, and rise to walk in newness of life. It's the best decision you'll ever make. And if we can help you with that, won't you come as we stand and as we sing.